Hi, it's the MLM for the Soul Channel, and I do have a new topic for today. Before I begin, I just would like to say, may the words and expressions of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of my heart find favor and acceptance before you, Hashem. Some people I thank have inspired me. hope they can inspire you as well. We'll have links below this video to their sites. Hey, Rabbi Shalom Arash, Rabbi Lazar Brody, Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi, Rabbi Eli Mansur, Rabbi Alon Anava, Rabbi Yuval Ovadja, Rabbi Daniel Asser, Nisan Baruch Black, David Sachs, Rabbi Michael Skolbach, Jewish for Judaism, Rabbi David Ashir, and Rabbi Yaron Ruvain. As well, if you've never checked out this channel before, I will have a link right below this video to my first video, which explains what MLM for the Soul means, what it stands for, and what I'm doing. So I call this topic today, it's called, um, Are You Ready for Zechariah 14? Now, if you're not familiar with Zechariah 14, or Zechariah, uh, Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi of DivineInformation.com mentions it a lot of times in his lectures, uh, because it's talking about what's going to happen in the end of days. So actually, um, in the Machser we just had for, for the holiday of Sukkot, we actually had that as part of the Haftorah reading for the first day. And this is taken from the Art School Machser, and I will have a link below to Art School so you can check out all the offer. But I thought it would be very interesting to go through this, because in here it gives you commentary. And I'm probably going to do some two videos, I just want to keep track of the time so it doesn't go too long. Um, so I'm going to start here, I'm probably going to do half of it today and then half of it uh, post it um, the following uh, time, Ezra Hashem. So um, just to give you a little uh, background, so um, this prominent in the Haftorah subjects of Sukkot is the War of Gog and Magog, a cataclysmic series of battles that will result in the final redemption in the Messianic era. The Haftorah, the first day of that of the Shabbos of Cholamoy, deal with this war. According to Rashi, this topic is related to Sukkot because of the prophecy that those nations who would survive the wars would join Israel every year in celebrating the Sukkot festival. Nimuke Yosef to Megillah quotes a tradition from Rav Hai Gaon that the victory over Gog and Magog will take place in the month of Tishrei, the month of Sukkot. Well, that already actually happened, so I guess it's not going to happen this year if that's going to happen. So Rav Hirsch um, to um, Bamidbar discusses the interconnection between Gog and Magog and Sukkot. Following is a free rendition of his thesis. So um, this is before I get into actually reading it. So in the name Gog, one recognizes the word Gog, roof, and thereby at once sees the contrast to Sukkah, the weak, unstable covering of foliage. Actually, the whole history of mankind consists of this contrast. Just as people have the power to make themselves safe and secure against their earthly contemporaries by sturdy walls, so they delude themselves into thinking that they can make themselves safe and secure against that which comes from above against Hashem and his power to direct matters. Well, that's not really right, right? That's not going to do them any good. They think that they can find security in the protection of their own might, take their fates, fate in their own hands, and crown the building up of human greatness with gabled roofs, rendering them independent of Hashem. So the War of Gog and Magog is the battle of Gog, roof, against Sukkah, the fight of the roof illusion of human greatness, which never allows rest, against the Sukkah truth of cheerful confidence and serenity, which comes of placing one's trust in Hashem's protection. Rav Hirsch's exposition, uh, exposition of the Gog-Magog relationship bases itself on the Hebrew grammatical rule that the prefix mem expresses the idea of project, projecting something. For example, or is light, ma'or, luminary, is a heavenly body which projects light. So to Gog, meaning roof, in Rav Hirsch's view, is, it represents the philosophy that man can insulate himself against the heavenly power of Hashem. Magog is the attempt to project this philosophy on earth. Very interesting. That's from uh, Art School Yechezkel. So Zach Zachariah, or Zachariah's prophecies came at a critical juncture in Israel's history. 17 years after King Cyrus had given permission for the second temple to be built, construction had stopped upon orders of King Achashverosh and after the harassment and slanders of the Gentile nations who surrounded Yushalayim. Morale was low and despair was prevalent in the bedraggled Jewish settlement. Then Hashem sent Zachariah to command the people under their leaders, Zerubbabel and Yoshua, to ignore their fears and resume construction of the temple. Hashem promised them success, and indeed soon after that, King Dar Darius, or Daryavish in Hebrew, of Persia, sanctioned the undertaking. In the chapter, which is today's Haftorah, meaning it was for circus, it's not really today, but it's what it says here. Zechariah prophecies that the cataclysmic war of Gog and Magog will climax with the final redemption, and the acknowledgement by the nations that Hashem alone is king, and that Israel is his people. This realization will be celebrated on Sukkot, for which reason it was chosen as Haftorah for the first day of Sukkot. Um, and then I just tell you for a discussion of the war, you just see our school's commentary to Yechezka. So now I'm actually going to read from it, and I will read the Hebrew and English. Hopefully it won't take too long. And I'm going to read 
uh, a few pasuks, a few pesukim at a time, or a few verses at a time, and then do the commentary. And there is commentary to some of words in, in these verses, so I will share that as well. So behold, Hashem, Hashem's awaited day is coming, and your scrolls will be divided in your midst. So when it talks about Hashem's day is coming, i.e. the day when Gog and Magog will wage their great war, uh, will come one day. It will result in the revelation of Hashem's greatness to the entire world, and the scrolls that have been robbed from Israel will be returned to be divided among the newly triumphant Jews. I shall gather all the nations to Israel to wage war. The city will be conquered, the home plundered, and the woman violated. Half the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then Hashem will go out and wage war against those nations as on the day he warred the day of battle. So this gets very, like, intense. As I go along, you'll hear some of the things. It's... Now, some people might not want to hear this, but I think we need to know the truth so that we can change and do tshuva, okay? So when it says the day of battle, it means uh, the, the day Hashem intervened at the Sea of Reeds to save Israel from the pursuing Egyptians. Then, as now, the Jewish people appear to be in mortal danger. Okay, continuing on. Uh, um, okay, so that's where I'm stopping because that's like a paragraph here in English. So on that day, his feet, meaning Hashem, saying, will, stru- will stand astride the Mount of Olives, which faces Yerushalayim in the east, and the Mount of Olives will split at its center, eastward and westward, making a huge ravine. Half the mountain will move northward and half southward. So that sounds like an earthquake. So that it, that will, that's destined to happen. So when it says stand astride, Hashem's intervention to perform miracles will be as plain as if he were standing on the mountain. The Mount of Olives will split as if uh, through an earthquake creating a ravine, the Jews in, endangered by Gog's invasion will flee through the ravine and Hashem will fight the adversary. Okay, um, then you will flee for the ravine will extend to Atzul. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah of Yehuda. Then Hashem, my God, will come with all the angels to your aid. And it will happen on that day that there will be neither clear light nor heavy darkness. Bayom Hahu, that's talking about the day of redemption. That's always what it says, Bayom Hahu. Um, what happened on that day, though, though, neither clear light nor heavy darkness. So that means the passage is figurative. The Jewish people will be confused, not being sure whether they are seeing the light of salvation or the darkness of defeat. This will go on for a whole day, understood only by Hashem, neither day nor night, but towards evening it will be perceived as light. Okay? <speaking in Hebrew> Uh, okay, I'm going to stop right there. I think I might stop there uh, with the um, with this video and then continue next week just to finish up. It will be on that day that fresh water will flow from Yishalayim half to the eastern sea and half backwards to the west. In summer and winter, the flow will continue. So when it talks about the fresh water will flow, this will be a fulfillment of the prophecies in Yechezkel and, and, and uh, Yoel, and it will be an indication of the great salvation. The eastern sea is the Dead Sea and the western sea is the Mediterranean. This fresh water that will not dry out in summer or freeze in winter will bring prosperity and happiness to the country. Hashem will be king over all the world. On that day, Hashem will be one and his name will be one. So a famous passage, there's no commentary on that, but we all know what that means. The entire area will be transformed to a plain. That's spelled P-L-A-I-N, not A-N-E. From the hill of Rimon, south of Shalayim, the city will rise high on its original site. From the gate of Benjamin until the place of the first gate to the inner gate and from the tower of Hananel to the royal wine cellar. So when it says to a plain, um, 
The entire topography of the Jerusalem world area will change. The Judean hills will flatten and become a plain, with Jerusalem rising prominently and beautifully in its midst. So you can imagine something. The mountain will flatten down, and Jerusalem therefore will be more uplifted and be more visible. Okay, um, and then they will dwell within her, and destruction shall be no more. Jerusalem shall dwell secure. So uh, that's where I'm going to stop right now and continue. There isn't that much more, but then it gets a little bit more intense as far as what will actually happen to the other nations uh, or to people that are not following Hashem, please. So this just gives you a little bit of insight into what will actually happen on that day, and I hope that we all will merit to live and see the coming Mashiach speedily in our days and the rebuilding of our final and everlasting base. Amen. And thanks for watching.